Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Trek Wars at OSU. That's Oregon State University. My name is Dr. Joseph Orozco, and I'm a professor of philosophy at Oregon State. I'm also the co-director of the Inaris Project for Alternative Futures. Today, I want to do a review of the series Star Trek Lower Decks. This is the latest installment of the Star Trek universe, and it just completed its first season. Now, I really enjoyed the show quite a lot. And part of the reason that I like it so much is I think that the writing is just so clever. Star Trek Lower Decks has been called a love poem to Star Trek. And you can see this in the way that each episode is just chock full of different kinds of Easter eggs. There's so many different references to past series in each episode that it's really a treat to try to watch and to catch all of the different references to 50 years of TVs, movies, books, and pop culture that are represented in the episodes. But I think that Star Trek Lower Decks is important for some other reasons. Now, as we've talked about in Trek Wars at OSU for a long time, Star Trek is unique amongst many science fiction franchises today in portraying a future that is progressive and hopeful. It presents a picture of what is possible if people are able to cooperate, learn from each other's differences, and to utilize technology to achieve this kind of future of human flourishing. And I think that Star Trek Lower Decks may be really unique in the Star Trek universe for one reason. I think that Star Trek Lower Decks might be the most utopian series of them all. So what does it mean to say that Star Trek Lower Decks is the most utopian Star Trek series of them all? I know that this is probably a controversial thing to say because when people think of hopeful Star Trek, they often point to the original series or to Next Generation. Many have said that modern Star Trek, which includes Discovery, Picard, and even Lower Decks, present a darker, more dystopian future, and they don't like it for those reasons. Now, here at Trek Wars at OSU, we've talked about whether these utopian values come out, for instance, in Star Trek Picard, and I think they really do. But I think that Lower Deck might be even stronger on this front. I think that there are two reasons why Lower Deck is important. One is that Lower Decks allows us to see a kind of transition point between older Trek and new Trek. It's a bridge, for instance, between the next generation and Star Trek Picard. Lower Decks is set in the year 2380 and Picard takes place in 2399. So there's almost a 20 year gap later. But Lower Decks takes place just a few years before some important events that set off the storylines in Star Trek Picard, namely the synth attack on Mars. This is an attack that's supposed to take place in 2385, so just five years after Lower Decks. And as we learn in Picard, that attack really alters the nature of the Federation and the role of Starfleet in the universe. I think that Lower Decks can help us understand that transformation. So that's one reason why I think Lower Decks is important. But I also think that Lower Decks is important because its stories give us good insight into what it means to uphold utopian values and to struggle for a better society. I think that Lower Decks allows us to reflect on the meaning of utopia in a way that very few Star Trek series up to now have been able to do. So how does Lower Decks help us to understand utopia better? I think that Lower Decks is what author Tom Moylan calls an ambiguous or critical utopia. So in his 1986 book, the De Demand the Impossible, Moylan characterizes a new development in utopian literature that he calls the ambiguous or critical utopia. The critical utopia talks about the perfect society in a different way that older accounts do. Older utopian stories, such as Thomas More's Utopia, which is the genesis in some sense of the entire genre of utopian literature, those older stories tended to have what Moylan calls blueprint utopias. They describe the perfect society in detail down to the ways in which people eat, drink, sleep, along with the shape of buildings, institutions, and styles of dress and fashion. In other words, they could almost serve like a blueprint for building an ideal world. Now, the critical utopia does something different. Instead of talking about utopia as a static world that's already built, it talks about the perfect society as imperfectly realized and something we have to strive to attain something that lays beyond us that we have to work toward. The critical utopia may use a supposedly perfect society as a setting, but it tries to show that the small ways in which that society is still imperfect or flawed. A good example of the ambiguous or critical utopia, Moylan says, is Ursula K. Le Guin's The Dispossessed. 
here in the dispossessed, we have a society that's achieved its political goals and it's built the perfect anarchist utopia. But what Le Guin does in the novel is shows how there are ways in which Anares, the anarchist utopia, still fails to fully satisfy its citizens. It, it, she shows the ways in which it fails to offer the opportunity for full human flourishing, even though all the political goals of society are realized. And in doing this and showing these cracks or imperfections, she is also helping us to wonder what a really perfect society would have to have in it to achieve utopian standing. So I think that Lower Decks functions as a kind of perfect utopia because it's a critical utopia. It's a critical utopia that allows us to better reflect on the utopian values of the Federation and to see the kinds of imperfections of Starfleet in a way that not only help us to understand the events of Star Trek Picard, for instance, but Lower Decks also helps us to understand today more carefully the values of the Federation, to think more carefully about what kind of utopia is represented in the progressive vision of the Star Trek universe. And maybe it can help us to think about what it might take to work toward that kind of society. So let's talk about the ambiguously utopian lessons of Star Trek Lower Decks. Now, before we go on, I just wanna warn people that there's gonna be spoilers in what I have to say in the rest of this video. So if you haven't watched all of Lower Decks yet, you might wanna hold off on the rest of this until you do. And there's also gonna be some spoilers from Star Trek Picard. So just warning you to let you know, uh, if you haven't seen those shows uh, and you wanna enjoy them fully, you might wanna hold off a little bit on this discussion. So, what are the ambiguously utopian lessons of Lower Decks? The first ambiguously utopian moment comes, I think, in the first episode of Lower Decks, episode one entitled Second Contact. Now, the USS Cerritos is unlike other Starfleet ships, such as the USS Enterprise. The Cerritos is, uh, job is not to explore strange new worlds and to seek out new life. Its job is to come afterwards and to work out relationships with alien races that have already been contacted by ships like the Enterprise. So in the first episode, Second Contact, we find the crew of the Cerritos negotiating with the Gallardonian High Council, creating a basis for trade and for development. So at the beginning of this, you see Commander Ransom shaking hands with some of the Gallardonian council leaders, beginning the, uh, the relationship with them. Now, one of the main storylines in this episode involves Ensign Beckett Mariner. And what we see her doing in one of these storylines is giving some of the Gallardonians Starfleet technology in a backwoods kind of way. As we find out in the episode, Mariner's helping some of the poor farmers to gain access to farming equipment so that they can avoid starving. So the usual distribution of tools and technology appears too slow and cumbersome. So Mariner is responding to the immediate material needs of the Gallardonian people, rather than wait around for the institutional procedures to run their course. Here we see something, a story that seems to be suggesting that the official channels of Starfleet might not be able to recognize people in need on the ground because of the importance of establishing the right diplomatic channels. The suggestion here is that maybe the Federation has become too institutional, too bureaucratic, too bound up with appearances to be really an effective force for good, and that Mariner represents someone who really understands what people might need and is working in a way that goes against the rules and procedures of the bureaucratic entity that Starfleet has become. In episode five, named Temporal Edict, we're faced with another question that starts to raise questions about the, uh, the, the nature of the Federation. We're faced with the question of whether Starfleet has become too concerned with rule obedience this time. So in episode five, we learn of the tradition amongst the lower deck officers to pad their work logs with extra time so that they go leisurely about their work. Here you see the lower decks having uh, margaritas in the middle of their shift. Now the Cerritos captain, Captain Freeman, learns of this tradition 
and she implements orders that force everyone to work at a much higher efficiency rate. And the episode shows how the ship begins to break down because everyone is running around trying to meet their work quotas in impossible timeframes. At the end of the episode, Ensign Boimler is able to get Freeman to recognize the importance of allowing people to have discretion in their work and not forcing them to submit to the clock. That way people can do quality work, even if it takes a little bit longer and there's more time to relax. Now, this seems like an important lesson, but it's clear that the drive to efficiency has become a value that is deep seated in Starfleet culture, despite what comes to be known as the Boimler effect. And in some cases, this emphasis on efficiency and obeying the rules as efficiently as possible seems to have disastrous consequences. In episode seven, Much Ado About Boimler, we find Ensigns Rutherford and Boimler trying to test some changes to the transporter in order to arrive at new levels of efficiency measured in just microsecond delays. Of course, what happens is that the quest to shore off just a few more moments off transporter time is that Boimler ends up stuck in a transporter malfunction and he lives in this phased reality for most of the episode. Now the effect turns out to be temporary, but I think it's interesting about the ways in which the search for being time efficient in work is the subject of at least two episodes in Lower Deck, reflecting that somehow the priority of efficiency has come to take uh, center stage above other values. And it's something that Star Trek Lower Deck says is something that we need to guard against actively. We need to guard against this tendency to be efficient and rule obedience, and that maybe Starfleet is becoming too concerned with this tendency. In episode nine, Crisis Points, we find a scene that seems to be one of recent revolution and upheaval on some unnamed planet. A hero statue is being pulled down, and then a rat-like being is being led in chains by two reptile creatures. Again, Ensign Mariner appears, and she addresses the reptiles, telling them that they no longer have to live in oppression to the rats, and they don't have to serve as the food. So she relishes a little bit in being their liberator. So almost immediately after this kind of speech, Captain Freeman appears and apologizes to the rat leaders for Mariner's interference. So she takes Mariner aside and she tells her that it's inappropriate to interfere in this society to save the lizards from rat oppression. And that Freeman is now gonna have to explain to Starfleet how a previously peaceful society has exploded into a revolution. And so she tries to cover up the scenario again, essentially putting the rat leaders back into power. Now, what's interesting about this episode is the way in which Freeman describes the situation on this planet. She calls it a peaceful one, even though it is one in which the rat beings have held the lizards in a kind of slavery and have been using them for food for generations. Now, there may not be war on this planet, but it's clear that there's a kind of violence going on. And that violence of oppression is not something that gets registered by the Federation. It's certainly not something that justifies intervention as Freeman points out. So I think that Mariner's actions here, her intervention and Freeman's official reaction to what Mariner does raise questions about whether the Federation is really posed to acknowledge oppression and to be a force that works for the well-being of sentient creatures. I think this issue about whether or not Starfleet can recognize oppression and be a force for liberation is highlighted by what happens in the season finale, episode 10, entitled No Small Parts. Now, I love this episode for a variety of reasons, but one of the main ones is that it takes us back to Beta 3, a planet that was first discovered by Captain Kirk and the Enterprise in the original series episode, The Return of the Archons. No Small Parts opens with Captain Freeman returning after many years to Beta 3 to find out what it's happened, what its inhabitants have been doing. And it turns out that they've started again to listen to Landru, the artificial intelligence that used to rule the planet in an, in an authoritarian way. It squelched their individuality, it, it, it squelched the free expression of people's ideas, and it had insistence on, it insisted on obedience to Landru. Captain Freeman expresses some frustration with this situation and threatens Landru with a Kirk-style shutdown. And Landru immediately says, oh, sorry. The inhabitants of Beta 3 walk away from this scene grumbling, some of them clearly expressing a nostalgia for the old ways of being dominated by Landru. 
But before the Cerritos can leave to their own device, leave the Beta 3 folk to their own devices, we see Mariner again taking her own initiatives. She has beamed down to the planet and she starts to do her own liberation work again. She starts distributing crayons and art supplies to the children of Beta 3, encouraging them to develop their imagination and their creativity. She recognizes that part of the problem here is making sure that people can think differently about their society at a grassroots everyday level. Whereas Freeman, Captain Freeman tries to solve the problem going on in Beta 3 by threatening the leaders at the top to act differently. I think the problem that's represented in this episode is one that's very relevant to our world today. And it makes me think of the work of Astra Taylor. Now in her book, Democracy may not exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone. Taylor talks about the history of democracy and what it means for people in the world today. She traces democracy from ancient Athens and shows how it started as a form of government by ordinary people to set up a system that would limit the power of rich oligarchical elites and to prevent those elites from being able to exercise oppressive power over ordinary people. The lesson that Taylor gathers from looking at this history of democracy and the ways in which people around the world experience growing threats to democratic systems today is that democracy is hard. It's a form of power sharing that takes a lot of time and attention on the part of ordinary people. And it can become tempting to let that vigilance slide away, especially if there's material or status rewards for allowing elites to assume more power. Taylor suggests that democracy requires us to really want it to want a society in which ordinary people are the leaders and to drive the vision of society like that forward. But that demands that we have systems in place to encourage education and imagination of what a better society can be and what it might look like. I think in the episode that we see uh, Mariner uh, handing out crayons is that she seems to recognize this difficulty. Landrew on Beta 3, might not change because the Federation insists, or at least Landrew might give lip service to the Federation and to change when eyes are on it. But the adults of Beta 3 clearly seem to feel that it might be better to go to the old ways of obedience to Landrew. Maybe if the children can imagine something different, Mariner suggests, maybe if they can imagine some alternative world, then Landrew's grip can really be broken whereas the adults don't seem to have the capacity to really break from the past. The final way in which Lower Decks might work as a critical utopia is the way in which it tells stories about technology. Now, I've done a whole other podcast on the really interesting ways in which Lower Decks contains narratives about science and technology, so I won't go too much into those here today. But I do think that Lower Decks raises the question about whether the Federation has become too reliant on technology. Now, this is an interesting story to uh, consider because Star Trek is one of those science fiction series that relishes the idea of being grounded in the possibilities of science and technology. And it's infamous for indulging in all kinds of techno babble that comes to the rescue at the end of an episode. But maybe that reliance on the techno babble is part of the problem. In the original series, we did have a story that warned about the danger of technology. And one of the clear episodes of that is The Ultimate Computer. In that classic episode, we're introduced to Dr. Richard Daystrom and his creation, the M5 computer, that threatens to be so sophisticated that it could replace entire Starship crews. But as it turns out in the episode, the M5 is not really up to the task. And in fact, it's dangerous. The lesson here seems to be that there are some things that science and technology simply cannot replace such as a good leader with a loyal crew and human beings that can trust each other and have intuition about what is right to do. In episode seven of Lower Decks, we have again the story of Ensign Tendi and the artificially created being she builds in her spare time, dog. Since Tendi is an Orion, she doesn't have any context for what a real dog from Earth is like. So the being that she creates looks like a normal dog, but it's able to talk, to shapeshift, to fly, and to shoot lightning. It only avoids becoming a Frankenstein-like monster because of the way that Tendi embraces it and takes care of Dog. But what's interesting about Dog is how unlike Dog is from 
another synthetic life form that we come across in the new Trek. That new synthetic creature is the synthetic daughter of Lieutenant Commander Data named Sutra in Star Trek Picard. In Picard, we learned that a whole race of synthetic artificial beings have been built by rogue Federation scientists, and they've been kept away from view because of the ban on synthetic life after the attack on Mars. And as such, these synthetic beings have grown up to be smart and powerful, but they're also suspicious, fearful of, artificial, of, of, of organic life. They're vengeful, and in fact, they're murderous. In other words, they have become Frankenstein monsters because they were not given the chance to develop into caring beings. Indeed, one of the really good parts of the finale of Star Trek Picard is the storyline in which Picard gives up his life to be able to show Sutra's synthetic sister, Soji, that she need not live in fear and suspicion of organic life and that she can learn to trust and to care. And this is part of what it means to, in some sense, be human. This is something that I think that prevents Dog from becoming a real monster in the show. Now, Tendi has another story about technology in the season finale of Lower Decks. In episode 10, she's shown to be the liaison officer for an exocomp officer named Peanut Hamper. Now, remember that exocomps were a robotic life form from the next generation. And exocomps started to develop complex intelligence and they eventually achieved singularity, that is self-awareness and personhood. So here in Lower Decks, Peanut Hamper has become a Starfleet officer and shows amazing abilities and usefulness to her crewmates. But of course, at the end of the episode, Peanut Hamper fails in a moment of crisis and refuses to help out, saving herself instead of her ship when she was the one that could really bring the skills needed to bear on the crisis that they had in front of them. I wonder where this story is telling us that we need to be careful about relying on technology to save us. After all, it seems that, that one of the major disasters of the Star Trek universe, the attack on Mars in 2385, comes as a result of having an over-reliance on an automated workforce. The Utopia Planitia shipyards on Mars are all destroyed when the A500 Siths are infiltrated by a Romulan virus. The result is a much changed Starfleet, the deaths of millions of Romul on Romulus and Remus, and it leads to Picard eventually having to leave Starfleet and the events that happened 20 years later in Star Trek Picard. So let me try to sum up what I think are the lessons of Lower Decks that help us to think about utopia. Why is Lower Decks a really good critical utopia? One, I think that Lower Decks teaches us that we need to not let the needs of bureaucracies and institutions obscure the real needs of people. The way in which Mariner is able to recognize the needs of the Gallardonian farmers in a way that the official officers creating diplomatic relationships with the Gallardonian high councils, uh, the way that she's able to recognize that suggests that maybe Starfleet has become too bureaucratic and that one of the things that we need to learn is not letting institutions develop their own priorities uh, at the expense of the people who's, who serve uh, in those bureaucracies and for whom those bureaucracies are created. Second, I think that we need to be careful about not seeking efficiency for its own sake. Now, in the other podcast that I did about technology in Lower Decks, I talk a little bit about critiques of various philosophers in the 20th century that say that one of the tendencies of modern society is to seek efficiency for its own sake, obscuring other kinds of values. And the need to make things fast and efficient can sometimes obscure other values that make society free and worth living for. And so there's a real danger, I think, in putting efficiency as an important value in the development of institutions and of society in general. We have to not forget an important lesson, and I think this comes out of the experience of Mariner on the rat lizard planet. We need to remember that no justice, no peace. What does this mean? Well, as I suggested, Captain Freeman calls the rat lizard planet a peaceful one, even though it's very clear that it's one of the subjugation of the sentient 
uh, race by another race of people. The rats are eating the lizards and the lizards perhaps may not know any better about it, but still it seems to be a case of violence. And so Mariner recognizes that there's a problem here that the uh, lizards deserve to be able to be free and to do what they want. And in this society, they can't. There's no justice for the lizards, but nonetheless, Captain Freeman has to apologize for that interference put the rats back into power. And this suggests that for the Federation, having peace is more important than serving justice. And I think that that's a real problem to, to, to worry about. We need to think about what happens on beta three, that on beta three, the, the people of Beta 3 have been liberated in some sense from the control of Landru, but it's very clear that their minds are still in thrall to the good old days in which things might have seemed safer, simpler with Landru in control. And what this suggests, I think, is that human flourishing needs more than just being free of oppression, being, being uh, one of liberty. Liberty and human flourishing needs a certain kind of nurturance. We need to be trained on how to maintain free societies. I think that Mariner recognizes this by handing out the art supplies and crayons to children, that imagination is really important for a free democratic society because without citizens being able to think about alternatives, to be able to imagine and to strive for a more perfect society, there's a tendency to slip back and to allow material needs and security to overwhelm us. And that starts to erode the power of democracy. So human flourishing in a democratic system needs more than just freedom or liberty. It needs a certain kind of emphasis on imagination and creativity to imagine the horizon of utopian possibilities. And finally, I think that what Lower Decks might be telling us is that technology is an important tool for human freedom, but we have to be clear about what our purposes, priorities, and fears are when we use technology. This story isn't necessarily new and it's not necessarily something that Lower Decks is uh, original about. This is the story of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Frankenstein's monster becomes a monster not because it's artificially created, not because it's something that is the result of science. The monster becomes a monster because of the way that Frankenstein, the scientist, treats it in the same way that dog doesn't become a monster because of the care that Tendi gives it. Now, da Data's daughter, Sutra, becomes a monster because she's never been given the opportunity to care and to trust. This is something that Picard teaches Soji. So I think that part of the lesson that we're getting from Lower Decks and also from Star Trek Picard is that technology is important, something that we shouldn't shun, but we have to be very clear about what our priorities are, who we are and what our moral identity is. Because without that kind of care and attention, our creations can become monsters. So I think that these are some of the utopian lessons of Lower Decks. I think that as a critical utopia, it helps us to think about what utopia is and what are the difficulties in trying to achieve utopia. And I think it does this in ways that are even more impressive than some of the series that are often thought of as the ultimate utopian versions of the Star Trek universe, for instance, the original series and the next generation. I think that Star Trek Lower Decks gives us an opportunity to really think about what a kind of perfect society the Federation is or could become. And by showing us the ways in which the Federation falls short of achieving a utopia, it helps us, the viewers, to be able to understand the real essence of utopia in a new and interesting way.